Thank you. All right, so good evening. So I'll talk a little bit about Apache today, Apache, the web server, Apache, the organization, Apache, the sort of like the open source phenomena behind the, the World Wide Web. I'll be talking a little bit about the industry and why sort of like some of things came from gorgeous places like this. A bit about myself. My name is Dirk van van Gulik. Um, once upon a time, I was a proper engineer, a biophysicist, and then sort of like things went a little bit awry, and I sort of like ended up in this, this internet world, in this IT world, the world you all inhabit. Um, I've done various things, Wor worked as a civil servant for about half my life for a large organization like the European Commission and the, the BBC, the, the English Public Broadcaster, and for the other half of my life I've been working for startups and large companies, usually sort of like as a CTO or as a, or as a, a fixer of complex problems, uh, helping startups and helping large companies alike. But today sort of like will mostly be about the industry and open source. So kind of like we were talking about uh, Apache, open source and community over code, because actually a lot of IT is not about code, but it's about community, especially sort of like when you think about it from open standards, open source and Apache. A little bit about the industry, sort of like what, what, what is that industry and, and where are you in that? And finally, I will make a very strong plea that engineering is messy and it should be. But first of all, like back to that picture. So here, sort of like you see the Alps, over there you see France, that's the Monte Rosa, you see the Matterhorn just around the corner in Switzerland, absolutely gorgeous place, and actually one of the birthplaces of the World Wide Web in Europe. And the reason why it's sort of like so gorgeous and almost uninhabited is because there's sort of like a nuclear power plant over there, and they tend to place those things in the middle of nowhere, so when they go bang, not many people get hit, and half the stuff, this is Italy, half the stuff lands in other countries like France and, and Switzerland. So this was actually a place for the joint research of the European Commission, some sort of like TNO, but then on a European scale, uh, where they did a lot of like risky things, expensive things, dangerous things, or things which require, required a lot of trust. And this kind of like is where I ended up having to uh, look at satellite pictures, specifically a picture around Africa, because around Africa something funny happens, sort of like around the middle regions, because there the water sort of like changes temperature twice as often as at the higher latitudes. And there was something odd with that, because it seemed as if the water was getting warmer and warmer every year. Now we kind of think that's quite normal, but then we thought like everything must be wrong, our calibration must be wrong, and there's something wrong with that, but it's not supposed to get warm on the Earth. So, but the problem was sort of like that those satellites are, are very fragile beasts. They, they circle around Earth, and they don't have very big brains, because they're sort of like out there with all the radiation, you get hit by meteorites, also the water technical issue prevent the satellite from having a big brain. So that means that the data which comes off those, those satellites is very complex and very hard to read. And not only that, those satellites sort of like circle the Earth, quite a few of them, um, in all sorts of orbits, and they sort of like make pictures which you're trying to combine, but every satellite is different. That satellite is fine, that one is a little bit too dark because it got hit by something which made it a bit too dark. That one was absolutely fine until that day, and then suddenly the clock went haywire, you always have to uh, subtract three hours. That one's got a scratch on his lens. And so like if you're dealing with thousands and thousands of images, it really gets hard to remember which satellite had what problem and everything else. So that's kind of like why I was supposed to check that, because it's very easy to make a mistake. And uh, well, you saw the previous picture, it was very near the area, so, so yeah, this didn't sound too much fun. But I'd seen something at, at CERN, at the Particle Physics Lab in, in Geneva, which was called a data server, which let you basically put an abstraction layer, an API, an interface, as you would call it today, over your data. So you could sort of like teach this interface layer all the things about the special satellite, and then you asked it for a picture, like, I want to have a picture of that area on that date. It would find out what the nearest picture was, what the nearest date was. It would sort of like pull it off these optical platters and then apply all those special rules about like the time being wrong, the calibration being wrong, the top half being too, too dark, the second scan line being completely buggered up. It would sort of like apply all those things and correct it for you. So basically, I could do my work a lot quicker and enjoy uh, Italy and all sorts of other fun things to play with. And this sort of like all went uh, really rather well because there was this thing called a web server, or rather a data server, which we now call a web server. The little problem was it wasn't really designed to do this. It was just designed to solve like, yeah, surface particle physics data and perhaps a few other things. And yeah, it didn't really work. And quite a few of my colleagues in the US and other parts of the world, they were doing the same thing with, with weather data, with magazines, with basically what, what, what later would be called Yahoo, uh, which basically what later would be called Hotmail. They were trying to also use this, this, this web server for things it wasn't really designed for. So we sort of like ended up sort of like putting layer and layer of duct tape over it to sort of like keep that thing working. And it, well, it didn't really work. Um, 
and also a little issue was that the browser, NCSAME was saying, was changing literally every week. So we think that Agile is pretty good now. Back then, they actually were so Agile that they pushed out a whole new browser every week. And then sort of like, but that was like really pushing it out, because this is actually from the email of Mark Andresen, where he sort of like announced that for the first time you could do GIF images in your web page. And sort of like, oh, well, image source equals thing looks quite innocent. Except that when this was first introduced, it was quite scary, because this is actually not valid as GML. It's actually broken. It's actually supposed to have a slash here or a closing tag. And Mark said, oh, yeah, I'll fix that. I'll, I'll put that in sometime later. Of course, he never did. Which basically meant that things broke, and not just a few times, it basically broke all the time. And um, yeah, that was sort of like a little bit of a problem because um, all this code was in C. C++ hadn't really been invented. D certainly wasn't there. Um, so th this kind of like, yeah, th this, this, this didn't really work. So we kind of like, as a group, had to find a new way of, of, of doing this. And what ended up, we sort of like ended up becoming a group of webmasters. We wouldn't call ourselves developers, even though I was like basically pro programming in C pretty much day and night. But, but basically webmasters, because it wasn't about the program, it was about getting things out. And that was odd, because our bosses often competed. They were literally like parts of competing companies, which are trying competing things out. For, m for me personally, it wasn't such a, such a difficult problem. I was a civil servant, basically employed by the European Commission to, to work on, on effectively getting satellite pictures by that time, to like basically getting the satellite picture on your screen for the, for the weather forecast and things like that. But, but still, like a lot of us still like competed. And the good thing was that most of our bosses kind of like all agreed that actually the server had to stay up. So they allowed us to sort of like collaborate, send each other patches, and effectively sort of like keep the bottom web server kind of like as functional as possible. So we had the thin internet layer and then the web server layer, and we sort of like could collectively keep that possible. While the bosses sort of like higher up, of course, they were fighting for market share. They were sort of like doing all sorts of commercial things. But we sort of like as technologists could sort of like do that. And we did that like through an informal mailing list where we sent each other endless patches and patches and patches. And that, uh, that sort of worked. In fact, it worked really rather well, because this is a picture from 1995, 2003, where basically Apache went from virtually zero to effectively sort of like cornering the entire market at the expense of, of NCSA, which had the market previously, and Microsoft, which had it next. And um, yeah, and then sort of like here you see the, the picture where sort of like where it is today, where effectively Apache has dropped quite a bit because some of the other browsers, specifically Nginx, has, has come up quite good. So this is actually quite positive to see that actually this really old piece of crufty code, which hasn't really <laughs> changed much since then, is actually now dying. But, but still, it's still sort of like 30, 40% of the market. So but the problem was sort of like that curve was a problem because that curve keeps going up and up and up. And with up comes more eyeballs, comes more power, comes more trouble. And trouble there was, um, because basically all these companies started to fight. All these companies wanted to have power, wanted to have influence, wanted to control this thing. And to make matters worse, Rob McCool, Elizabeth Frank, and uh, Mark Anderson, they sort of like left NCZ Mosaic, the university, to actually form Navio and Netscape, which later became the Netscape browser. So, no, so basically, sort of like our foundations were ripped away from us while basically everyone was sort of like fighting in the marketplace. So we kind of like took stock and actually ended up making a, a legal foundation, making a, a proper legal vehicle to contain the Apache source code in it with a whole set of rules and things like that. And actually sort of like to a large extent, it was the, the vision of a few companies like IBM, which sort of like helped us do this to so basically create a very neutral industry wide place where large industries, where large powers could, um, uh, could sort of like collaborate to uh, in, a, in a neutral space on open source co software, it basically in, in, a, in a way where they sort of like wouldn't fight into each other, we wouldn't fight with each other. That turned out to, to hit a raw nerve because a few years later there wasn't just Apache, there was XML, most of the Java stack, most of web services and SOAP were at Apache, and this kept growing and growing and growing. So right now we're sort of like some 300 of those projects uh, and basically some, some 50 in the making uh, as of this year. Interestingly enough, and this is actually something which, which you want to take to heart, a lot of the technology is, 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 is Java, but more importantly, a lot of this technology, you see here at the bottom, sits very low in the stack. It's not the sort of stuff you see on Twitter or on Facebook, it sits very much sort of like at those underpinnings. And in fact, so like even today, if you sort of like buy a DVD or, or if you buy, download a DVD really from like VMware or Oracle or, uh, um, or, or, or big IBM product, you'll find that this is the software which is on there. Like 90% of that is actually open source software from these lower layers. And that's kind of like what, what drives most of the technology today, most of the internet and most of the higher systems. But before we sort of like go there further, sort of like a, a little detour about two things. The first thing is about sort of like software and engineering. 
Um, software is a little bit special in the engineering disciplines. So if you go to normal engineering, you get these like, designs, these drawings of like, how you make this joist, how you make a roof. This stuff isn't secret. This stuff isn't patented. This stuff isn't protected. In fact, in a lot of countries, you can't even patent it. Um, uh, it's basically what's in your manual. Every engineer knows that that's how you build a roof. And you don't get paid for this drawing. You get paid for actually putting a roof on people, their houses, and knowing how to do that and how it is. And in fact, like if you think of like calculation of how strong that roof is, very often there are even like in the government like rules and laws of how you do that. So there's nothing secret about it. In software, that's quite different, because in software, quite often the code is not just the blueprint, but also the actual thing you make, the actual thing you, you get paid for. So, so a lot of existing legal frameworks don't really work for software, because code is the blueprint, it's the idea, it's the capturing of the idea, it's the actual thing you make money for, it's the actual thing you may sell to someone else. So, so there's something kind of like, yeah, not fitting there. And to make matters worse, well, this whole dilemma was playing out. Not all the countries in the world, specifically the US, had actually entered in what's, what's known as the Berm Convention, sort of like in the, the, the international law which deals with copyright. So out of that sort of like came effectively in that lull, in that sort of like uh, space, came basically sort of like open, open source and sort of like where it, uh, it basically became common. And for the rest of the talk, I'll basically be talking about like three types of open source. And really open source is, is it's, there's a license, but it's mostly about like collaboration. And there's a set of rules which govern that collaboration. And there are actually three basic sets, and they're actually captured in the licenses. The first most well-known license for open source software is called the free beer license, generally. It's the BSD license, the ASF license, the MIT license, the, 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 the Boost license. And it basically says, like, here's a piece of code, do with it what you want. If it breaks, you get to keep all the pieces, but you can do anything with what you want with it. You can copy it, you can mutilate it, you can change it, you can sell it, you can give it away, it doesn't matter, just do something with it. Very much like a drawing of the joists of the roof we had earlier. The second type of licenses, into which, for example, Linux is, um, is the free speech license. And that license sounds very, very, very much the same, except for one little twist. It says the code is so important the code needs to be so well protected that actually if you use this code or if you make any improvements to it, you have to give that to everyone else as well. So it's not sort of like in this case where you can sort of like do whatever you want and you can collaborate account. In this case, you have to collaborate and give it to others. So there's a self-perpetuity thing. It's sort of like it tries to sort of like protect itself. And then finally, sort of like the last and most recent type of open source, the Afrero licensed code, which effectively says like if you touch this code, you have to make everything else you have open source as well. So if you basically, and, and the reason why this was introduced was because a lot of big companies say they, they basically have cloud ser systems, have services, and because they never distribute their code, even if they use GPL code, they don't have to give back, and that's of course a little bit like against the audits community. So therefore, we've got the Afrero license as the third type, and each of those sort of like has a community behind it which believes in certain things. So these people tend to be the engineers, people sort of like who just want to build something, I want to be paid for building something. These people often value code and actually want to be built, want to be paid for the code and really value that the code stays right. And these folks actually go a step further and they say like basically any type of, of, of use of this code should mean that all code basically becomes available, all code becomes free. And we'll see sort of like a lot of those choices coming back in the rest of the presentation. And John Stevens, sort of like one of the main architects and currently sort of like purveyor of everything naughty, he sort of like said like a license can ruin a perfectly good piece of code. And you'll find that in your career that is sadly a very sad truth with, <laughs> with not much you can do about it, but it, uh, it, it, you get hit by it very often. So back to Apache. So basically what's the problem? Well, we had all these fighting commercial parties. We had very large corporate interests. Um, and actually, if you're a web server, or if you're anything at the lower foundations, there's no win of being special, right? There's no win of being, let's say, someone who makes uh, fridges and have a special wall plug, which is only the wall plug you have, because it isn't going to fit in the wall, right? So if you have a web server which can do all these fancy things, but no browser can talk to it, that's rather useless. So oh, there's, there's something happening there. So that also basically means if there's nothing unique about your code, well, you're not going to actually make much, much money with it, are you? I mean, you just need to have this, this connector or this, this other thing, but you're not, I mean, an XML parser, but you're going to make money with an XML parser because your XML parser is the same as everyone else's XML parser, otherwise it doesn't work. And then if the standard in which it was des described is really bad, well, yeah, that's even worse, right? So you have to maintain a piece of code, which is expensive. 
and, and there's no benefit. So what you then very, very often see sort of like, is that all of a sudden that becomes open source software because it's cheaper for everyone to just collaborate and use the, sa the, same, core, uh, the same code base and, and simply be, be done with it. And that's exactly sort of like the problem Apache is addressing, the problem Apache is solving, and actually the basis basically for pretty much the entire uh, internet today. And there's a little bit, little extra trick to it. Um, and that is basically that we sort of like really sort of like focus on the people then. Because if it's no longer the code which is important, it's actually the people and how people function, how you sort of like cont contribute to that code, how you keep it maintained and, and everything else. And a lot of that comes back in a very simple thing, which we call vote voting. So we're on this mailing list and we're discussing a certain change to the code. And you can say like, yes, I'm in favor of this. Nope, nope, I think uh, I'm against it, minus one. Or you say like, mm, yeah, whatever. But each of those votes has a catch. It's not a democracy, it's a meritocracy. Because if you say plus one, you also say, I will support this change. If it all goes lopsided and haywire and it was a really bad idea, I will actually actively help fix the mess I sort of like, yeah, kind of voted in favor of. Whereas if you veto, veto it, you're expected to help solve the problem. Because you can't have a situation where everyone is vetoing some change, which is actually needed by people. So if you veto something, that's fine, but then you are then sort of like part of the solution. Your part is sort of like going to help actually solve that problem. And sort of like this is like a, sort of like a neutral sort of thing. So that's kind of like what you see in a lot of, lot of uh, open source communities. You see like variations here of, of ways of collaborating. And this is actually quite important because these mechanisms often work in companies at the sort of like more practical layer as well, where being in favor of something usually also means you're committed to sort of like making it happen. So the real sort of like of that was, was basically a social engineering contract, uh, sort of like social engineering construct of, of sort of like these rules and these licenses, which ultimately sort of like let um, yeah, a whole open source industry uh, uh, to sort of like appear and allowed companies like Red Hat and Google and all the others to sort of like build on top of that. Um, it has a few clever things in it, a few important things which you can sort of like take with you. Um, a lot of community ownership. Um, the voting process really re reduces the risk of stagnation, so you're not dependent on just a single person, but if there's enough of a body of people who want to change something, the change will happen, because if you, if you vote against the change, it means you don't actually have to help fix the problem, so there's always sort of like a, a fair chance of getting things right. Um, and so it doesn't make large changes overly expensive. And at the same time, because you're sort of like doing this collaboratively, you're still somewhat protected from all those big corporate powers who want to grab a bit of land there, who want to grab a bit of land there, or sue someone and every, everything else. So for you, like very practically, so sort of like then, yeah, basically, what 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 can Apache do for you, or what can these open source projects do for you, or what can you do for these open source projects? And I think so, sort of like one of the things you find if you sort of like uh, start digging around those open source projects is that it can sort of like help you prepare. That you'll find a lot of the, the mature open source projects are places where you can sort of like build up merit, build up visibility by simply sort of like starting to. Um, like check the, the, look at the mailing list, see how people are interacting, help other people. So I try to help people sort of like understand things, make small changes. And so sort of like what you'll find is that quite quickly you'll sort of like get sucked into a process where you effectively sort of like, yeah, effectively be becoming a, an IT professional if you want, uh, but sort of like at a very sort of like modern sort of like easy sort of like ent uh, entry level. And also sort of like helps you sort of like to understand sort of like how you communicate about IT with other people. Because ultimately in a lot of IT jobs, it's not the IT itself, it's actually the communication part which is hard. And that's kind of like what you see a lot of people picking up in Apache and, and other open source communities. It's not so much the IT because that's what you've learned at school, it's how you work with it, how you communicate about it and how sort of like things go. So that's kind of like the, the, the first part about Apache.